Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining me on the Slice of Healthcare podcast. I'm your host, Jared Taylor. Today I'm joined by Oren Afek, the co-founder and CEO at Vim. How are you today? I'm great, Jared. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. I'm excited for us to chat. I was saying we're going to have to create a, a separate section for uh, basically is- Israeli uh, startups uh, or, or led led companies uh, because we've, we've had so many great conversations with, with companies over there. I know you're, you're based in the U.S., um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's always interesting to, uh, to talk. And we were talking a little bit before about the health conference and how I was telling you there was this whole separate area that was dedicated to Israeli startups. And it wasn't just a couple, it was like 20 plus, uh, and a lot of cool companies, um, a lot of companies focused with, uh, really great AI offerings. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that continues to grow, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on. I, we usually like to kickstart this. If you give the audience a little bit about your background and then we'll go through the why, how, what of them. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Jared. And, and yeah, by the way, I do agree. It's incredible. Like the past few years in Israel have been really, really interesting. And uh, we see a lot of uh, digital health acceleration here. I think mainly due to the fact that people are, you know, they, they grew up in a in an HMO, pretty consulted environment. And so they know what it means that healthcare is, you know, pretty coordinated and uh, and integrated. So for me, you know, I grew up here, uh, like everyone else, served in the military, did some special forces time, went to start a couple of companies, uh, one in the telecommunications space, one in the gaming space. Um, around 20, uh, 2015, I met Asaf and Yael, my two co-founders, and we got introduced by Sequoia Capital. A guy named Tom Morgenstern, now he's with Lightspeed, he introduced us three. And our, our vision that, you know, stayed, uh, uh, really tr- try to extract unwarranted variation from the healthcare system. Saf and I continued as the co-founders of the company. Saf is the CTO, I'm the CEO. Um, and, and the idea, as I said, remained kind of um, to truly look into marketplace like opportunity in healthcare. So imagine if you think about other marketplace platform like uh, just the big ones, Amazon, Airbnb, Uber. I think the idea is to truly use technology in order to tap the unwarranted variation, extract it out, and streamline the service, connect the provider and the, uh, the provider and the buyer, if you want, in an, in an efficient transaction. Um, healthcare is healthcare is big. Healthcare is is pretty complex, and we obviously needed to find our own niche, our, our place where we could be the best in the world at. And um, we believe that place is is truly connecting the different nodes in the healthcare network. So, what are those nodes? Those nodes are the ones that make clinical decisions. Healthcare is a very node-driven, you know, network-driven paradigm if you if you want to think about it that the physicians are driving a lot of the downstream cost and decisions it's less about patient decisions more about physician decisions and other clinical users who diagnose and then drive decisions so our, our vision is to bring those different nodes together allow them to better collaborate to exchange data um, and, and to work together to to drive a, a better impact and coordination in the system so that's kind of what drove us there i think both asaf and i you know came from non-healthcare industries came from places where um, you know, mission was not necessarily being the, the first priority. And, and I think both of us, as we got into our early 30s, we, we thought about, hey, let, let's do something that is, is meaningful, that is tackling a big problem, that is tackling injustice, that is that is truly have the impact to become and the potential to become a big company. So that's kind of how we got there. Yeah, we definitely want to give a shout out to uh, SF David, your co-founder. We're going to play a joke on him, but we'll, we won't do that. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll give him a shout out instead. And by the way, if you see these pills right here, those are those are breath mints from Health Conference. They put it in a, a pill bottle. I just want people to to not think I have like Vicodin or something behind me. Um, I, that's why I hit it. I was like, what is that? Um, yeah, they're, they're breath mints. Uh, RX uh, Review put them in. Uh, yeah, creative. Um, but also probably, uh, yeah, anyway, (laughs) um, cool. So, uh, thank you for your background. You also kind of went into, to kind of some of what I I was going to touch base upon next. So we don't need to go fully, but if there's any parts we miss, like, I guess this is the point that you can plug it in. Um, I usually Mm -hmm. ask about your why, how, what you really already gave us your why and kind of, uh, what you're building. And, and I like the, the. Amazon analogy. Uh, can you can you talk us through though more more about the how, if possible? Absolutely. Um, and then we'll go mm-hmm. into there's like one or two things that you and I want to discuss here today, and then we'll go from there. Absolutely. So I think um, you know, one of one of the biggest opportunities we've seen is integrating those nodes 
bring them together. Uh, we've seen a, an opportunity to to leapfrog existing technologies. Uh, Smart and Fire, HL7, we believe that those technologies are pretty limiting uh, in, in a sense that they are uh, restrictive in terms of where could you operate within a workflow. They're restrictive. Uh, it, it takes some time to integrate a different node to the existing processes. So we build a technology that is really unique in the sense that it, it, it's, uh, we, we're thinking about it as a rapid integration platform where the integration with the actual clinical node could be an EHR of any type, for example, it could be a CRM of any type, could be you know other call center software and so on and so forth. Uh, the integration itself, the IT lift, the technical lift will take a few minutes. Uh, and not just it's going to take a few minutes, it's also going to be able to surface the right information at the right time uh, and, and make it very contextually uh, uh, um, actionable and relevant. Uh, and I think that's the unique angle of the technology. Um, to, you know, to, to some extent, it's, it's really uh, a plug and play technology that allows you to deploy any type of content within a clinical workflow. So imagine that uh, we could we could deliver you know our largest customers including some of the largest payers like United Healthcare, Anthem, you know Florida Blue, Premier Blue Cross, and other large payers. And the ability to truly bring uh, information such as patient history, patient health history, um, open care gaps, um, other uh, type of information that allow the provider to subsequently submit prior authorization and other things that allows this bidirectional efficient communication. Surfacing this information at the point of care efficiently with integration that takes a few minutes uh, is, is a kind of truly a game changer that we're leveraging in the marketplace to build our network. And I think uh, that's subsequently is also going to open up for you know other developers that, that maybe are non-payer developers who may want to uh, you know create their own application at the point of care. So that's that's the how uh, if I had to kind of place place a, a finger on. Appreciate that. And, and just so the audience knows, because I, I follow a similar format with every episode, right? For the first episode, I want everyone to always understand your why, how, what. I can't take credit for that. I got that from Simon Sinek and, and why people care about your, your company and what you're selling and what you're doing. Um, but I always was I always didn't like that. I couldn't find a, a website where I could also go and just mm -hmm. learn about that, right? Like before I want to work with a company or partner with them, like I really want to understand that. And a lot of companies put that on their website, but I want to hear it from the founders, which is why I, I asked that question. So thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Uh, I, I want to dive into a question I have, and I'm really mm -hmm. excited to ask this because uh, it seems like I've been able to talk more about value-based care with guests uh, over the last let's say 50 episodes, more so than the, the first 150 plus that we had. Uh, but can you talk us through how technology can reduce the barriers to value-based care adoption? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Jordan. Look, I mean, let's let's take e-commerce as an example. Um, when we think about e-commerce and obviously blooming in the past few years, especially during COVID-19, every little seller could open their own online store, leveraging tools such as you know Wix, uh, Stripe, PayPal, uh, just download, plug and play, and you have a store, right? It's something you can start in an hour. Um, I think that the biggest barriers today, or one of the biggest barriers today for value-based care is interoperability. Um, if companies like Vib could come in and create a Stripe-like experience that basically creates, so, you know, what did Stripe do? Uh, enabling anyone to accept payments, right? In an easy way, that's how they started. One of the biggest barriers to create a true collaboration between providers, members, payers, and other providers is the ability to transfer data to create actions that are uh, longitudinal in nature and, and enable this kind of efficient, efficient system, right? I mean, if you think about the system here in Israel, it's all interconnected. That's why it's so easy and natural to, to have 100% value-based care enabled in, in the past 60 years for the entire population. How do you take similar concepts and take the complexity out of innovative companies so they can truly innovate and, and address the clinical decision maker, not the administrator, not the IT personnel, but the true clinical decision maker. So imagine that all, this, all these dollars and, and creative juices are gonna be focused on the clinical decision maker, the doctors, the nurses, the PAs, the MAs, and and we want to see ourselves as kind of this enabler, this this company that helps to reduce the barrier, the Stripe, the PayPal, the Plaid, if you want, if I'm using those e-commerce comparables, right, to, to to truly 
take out the complexity. Hey guys, you should focus on clinical innovation, not an administrative innovation, not an interoperability innovation. Let us take out, let, let, let us take this out of the equation. And, and that's what I believe technology can do for value-based care. I think value-based care models are there. Uh, risk varying entities, upside, downside, incentives, PMPM versus uh, risk sharing, you know, those things have been, you know, they, they, they've been out there for many years. The adoption, I believe, was limited because of technology. And, and I think the opportunity is, is, is being enabled thanks to technology. And, and that's, how, that's how we're thinking about that. Thank you. Yeah. And that's probably what I'm going to end up clipping, right? For our, our teaser to this episode, because um, always a question that I'm interested in hearing. And every time I hear it, there's obviously similarities, but there's also some cool differences from anyone I ask, which is really exciting for me, right? I love kind of hearing the different perspectives on it. Um, but it seems like everyone kind of agrees with the, always the main pieces, which makes sense, right? Anyone who supports value-based care probably, probably feels the same way. Um, can, can you talk us through a little bit uh, in terms of how you see the payer and provider partnership, payer and provider partnerships as a whole, uh, improving value of care uh, altogether? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, I think overall value of care is, is a game for everyone to participate, not just payers and providers. There's thousands and many thousands of companies in the United States that are well funded and are building a lot of innovation uh, that you know you probably saw uh, last week at Boston. Basically. Uh, anything from you know, remote patient monitoring and home testing and other technology that are able to you know, extract better data, uh, get to better decisions, so on and so forth. But I think payers and providers are in the ground zero of enabling all this innovation to truly affect behavior. So you know, if you want payer, uh, payers to some extent control the incentive, um, the, the, the dollars, uh, and they're responsible to distribute the dollars in a responsible way to then drive behavioral change. And providers are responsible for rendering care. In some countries like Israel and the UK and Australia, those entities are combined. Also in the US, in many Medicare Advantage scenarios, those entities are combined. Uh, but in the majority of the market, we still have those two different entities. And I think them working together to align incentives uh, and the right behaviors, I think is critical uh, for value-based care and for all the other thousands of companies to truly create an impact, right? Because once they build the infrastructure, once those payers and providers enable this infrastructure for us to innovate, this, this you know, I would say, organizing principle that allow us all uh, technology companies to innovate, I think that's become the canvas for us to create and to innovate and to deploy and create more efficiency and, and keep patients home uh, post discharge and to uh, you know, you know to, to enable better sharing of, of medical records and results so there's no duplicative testing all those things would follow but pairs and providers that are the ground zero are the element the most basic ingredient in, in this in this great in this great uh, uh, you know recipe now pairs and providers need to collaborate they need to sign contract that can make them successful but technology is critical. If the contract and the technology are not baked into each other, right? If the payer say, I would just ask the provider to do A, B, and C, but not helping with enablement. If the provider accepts a contract, but is not thinking about enablement, and the there's a disconnect between uh, you know, the contractual alignment, the incentives, and the technology by which those two entities are interacting, we're gonna continue to, you know not to have a lot of success with adoption for value-based care. And we've seen this in the past you know, many years and definitely since I got to the US eight years ago. So I think uh, providers and payers are critical to kick off this flywheel, to start spinning it. Uh, and I think they're gonna continue to stay critical ingredients, but you, you know, that, that's a must have for all the other innovative companies to, to kind of tag along. Uh, I think that's the true value for them is to kick off this infrastructure, this contractual, uh, mixed with technology and incentive infrastructure that uh, is is currently is currently missing and is very initial. I can't think of a better way to to segment. That was a perfect perfect last thought for everyone to to chew on. Uh, really appreciate again, Oren. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I want to have you on again soon. We'll talk about some other things now that we got the why, how, what out of the way and your background. Right, we don't need to go through that. On the next episode, but we were able to get your thoughts and, and opinions on um, 
value-based care and, and some key things regarding the, the payers and providers. Excited to have you on again soon and uh, wish you all the best of luck and especially, obviously, the company, uh, Vim as well. Thanks, Jared. Appreciate uh, you spending time today.